as the Allied forces pushed the German and Japanese armies further back into their own territory during World War II. The United States War Department realized something had to be done to destroy the impressively resilient enemy fortifications that protected the war-torn areas. The U.S. had to deal with the seemingly never-ending Siegfried Line in Europe, and Japanese fortifications had proven almost impenetrable in the Pacific against U.S. Navy naval gunfire. The answer to their problem was the Little David Mortar, also known as the Bunker Buster, a massive weapon that became the war's largest caliber gun. Footage from the U.S. Army Pictorial Service, filmed in 1945, shows how the 36-inch heavy mortar was assembled for action. By firing a shell of 3,600 pounds at a velocity of 1,600 pounds a second, Little David lived up to its ironic name after leaving craters so massive they left all witnesses in awe. Railway guns. A railroad gun, or a railway gun, is an artillery piece of gigantic proportions that is often the result of surplus naval artillery employed with ground forces. However, that has not always been the case, as some of them have been developed from the ground up with the particular purpose of being used with field armies. During the American Civil War, the Confederate forces used a railway 32-pounder Brook naval rifle mounted on a flat car. The Union also experimented with different 13-inch siege mortars to pummel the enemy. The U.S. Navy would then experiment with 14-inch railway guns at Sandy Hook to test if they were feasible for ground combat. And by the 1870s, both France and the United Kingdom were experimenting with different railway guns that would be employed years later during World War I. Still, prior to the outbreak of the war, the engineers had to go over the design considerations of those railway guns to successfully employ them for combat. They eventually came up with different methods to traverse a gun on a railway using a turntable, car traversing mounts, and separate gun mounts to rotate the gun with a top carriage traversing mount. Then, during the war, railroad guns were transported by sophisticated railway systems and wagons specially developed to handle their sheer size and weight. However, out of all the involved parties in the war, the Prussian Empire stood out thanks to the engineering innovations of the Krupp Company, famous for developing steel and artillery pieces of incredible power and unbelievable size. Although not necessarily a railway gun, the Germans developed the devastating 42cm Emgaret, or Big Bertha siege howitzer, to get rid of French and Belgian fortifications if the war against them ever came full circle. Almost simultaneously, the Prussians developed one of the world's largest siege guns ever fielded, the Paris gun. This long-range gun was 34 meters long, weighed 256 tons, and had a 211 millimeter caliber. The Germans even had to develop a unique railway system and a turntable mounting to transport it to the front line. And although the eventual Treaty of Versailles prohibited them from developing military technology, the Germans kept studying the concept of railway guns until they came up with even more devastating artillery. A challenge. As the Allied forces pushed the German army back to the fatherland during World War II, British, French, and American leaders struggled to find an effective way to achieve a breakthrough of the Siegfried Line. This German defensive line had been built in the 1930s as a counter to the French Maginot Line. The fortified positions stretched for more than 630 kilometers. From Cleve, close to the Netherlands, to Weil am Rhein in Switzerland, the Siegfried Line had more than 18,000 concrete bunkers with machine gun nests, artillery pieces, underground tunnels, and minefields. The German positions began being bombed by the Allies in September of 1944. Meanwhile, at the Pacific Theater, the U.S. Marines were fighting the Japanese in the gruesome Battle of Peleliu as part of their island-hopping campaigns. The U.S. War Department of Defense had realized that the only way to force Japan into submission was to invade the Japanese mainland, and it was not going to be easy. Japanese fortifications had proven highly resilient against the continuous battering of 16-inch U.S. Navy artillery from battleships during previous campaigns. 
and things would only get worse once the Marines made their way to Japan's home island bunkers. Expecting even more formidable structures, the War Department began developing a heavy weapon that could be used against German and Japanese fortifications. The result of this meticulous study was Little David, a 36-inch caliber mortar. Also dubbed the Bunker Buster, Little David was inspired by the British Mallets mortar employed during the Crimean War in 1857. Little David. Little David had a mass of 173,000 pounds, a barrel length of 22 feet, and a 36-inch caliber that overshadowed all the German cannons employed during the war. The device fired a shell of about 3,650 pounds at a speed of 1,250 feet per second at a maximum distance of six miles. Additionally, it comprised two major assemblies, the base and the 22-foot muzzle loading tube, while deployment and preparation to fire the weapon took up to 12 hours. In 1945 footage from the U.S. Army Pictorial Service that shows how the mortar was assembled and transported to its area of operations, the narrator explains that two tractors were explicitly built to carry the tow tube and base for what he calls a highly mobile experimental weapon. The two M26A1 tank tractors consisted of a 12-ton 6x6 truck and a semi-trailer that weighed around 40 tons and was dubbed the Dragon Wagon. And in addition, another separate tractor carried the 3,600-pound projectiles. Little David also required a bulldozer and a crane with a bucket shovel to dig the motor's emplacement. A 12-foot pit was dug out to make it easier to emplace the weapon's base assembly, and a 12-degree path was carved as an entrance ramp to place the base into the pit. Once the pit was finished, the crane was used to remove the bogey, and the bulldozer then added sand to the base's surroundings to minimize rearward motion when the mortar was fired. After the base was assembled, the soldiers built a timber runway used for the 40-ton tube to be driven directly into it. Afterward, a hydraulic pump and valve system raised the jacks to properly align the tube. The footage subsequently shows that Little David's site is attached to a remote connection system, and the soldiers are then seen preparing the powder charger used to fire the shells. After placing the T1 projectile, the mortar is elevated and aligned to fire on the designated location. Once set up, a light in the remote control box indicated that the mortar was ready for fire, and the gunner then pushed the firing button. The scene then shows the devastating effects of the 3,650-pound projectiles firing at 1,250 feet per second, with one of the craters left by Little David measuring 38 feet in diameter and 13 feet in depth. Despite its impressive firepower, Little David was never used in combat. It arrived in Europe in 1944 for testing, and it wasn't ready for action until July of 1945. By then, Germany had already surrendered, and the U.S. had already decided that it would use the atomic bombs against Japan. Thus, Little David's purpose to destroy enemy fortifications was never truly tested. One of the prototypes is still on display at the Proving Grounds in Aberdeen, Maryland, where it can be appreciated in all its might. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the Little David Mortar and other powerful guns used by World War II armies.